Welcome to History Talk, the podcast that brings together a panel of experts to discuss current events and historical perspective. I'm your new host, Brenna Miller. And I'm your other new host, Jessica Blissett. The 2016 presidential election has been historic for having the first female nominee from a major party and for electing the first person to have never before served in office or in the military. But the vitriol and divisiveness of the campaign has also seemed historic too, as levels of citizen trust in the candidates and the system seem at an all-time low. All of this came to a head on election night when the polls showing a Clinton win turned into a Trump victory. We're here with three historians to try to make sense of this by placing the 2016 election into historical perspective and to examine where we may be going from here. Via phone from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, we have Dr. Kimberly Hamlin, an associate professor of history and American studies who specializes on women and gender history in the 19th and 20th centuries. Hello. And in the studio, we have with us Mark Horger, a senior lecturer in the Department of Human Sciences at Ohio State University, specializing in cultural and intellectual history of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Pleasure to be here. And finally, we also have Paula Baker, an associate professor at Ohio State University who studies American political history, especially campaign finance. Good morning. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. So we kept hearing that the election was the ugliest it's ever been. But this is far from the first presidential campaign in which things turned ugly. So how does this election compare to past elections as far as personal attacks and accusations of criminal behavior go? And is there any reason to how and why such personal attacks sometimes dissipate versus gaining traction? And I think we'll start here maybe with Mark. Okay. Well, there you can certainly come up with previous uh, presidential cycles where there was a great deal of intense uh, uh, the personal uh, unpleasantness between the candidates. Uh, the one uh, I think might be the closest example might be uh, 1828 uh, when supporters of John Quincy Adams were quite open in their efforts to try to disqualify Andrew Jackson from the presidency on the basis of how many people he had killed personally uh, or had killed under his direct supervision, uh, either uh, as a uh, horse racing tout in the streets of Nashville or as a militia leader. And so you can think of of – Uh, examples along those lines. Uh, When I was trying to come up with an analogy, though, of the character of the animosity this cycle, and in particular the degree to which the character of this animosity wasn't just personal animus against uh, uh, the Clinton candidacy, but also based in uh, the xenophobic, uh, and I suppose we might as well just say them, you know, call them racist uh, attacks, not just against the candidate, but against her coalition. The other analogy I thought of was the 1928 cycle when Al Smith was nominated by the Democrats uh, as the first uh, Roman Catholic to be nominated on a major party ticket. And there was a great deal of anti-Catholic rhetoric in that campaign that would strike the modern observer as similar in its xenophobia uh, to what we've seen this cycle. Were those uh, criticisms in the past, those kinds of attacks, as effective, or do you think that they gained more or less traction? Well, it's, it's hard to judge because in the two examples I gave you, the perpetrators both won, but the perpetrators both had significant structural advantages in the, in the, in the electorate that suggest they would have won no matter what the rhetoric in the campaign. Uh, here we have an election that was very, very closely run uh, on the map, county to county. In fact, if you actually go in and look at uh, the vote totals, it looks strikingly like the 2000 election in which we have a situation where uh, one candidate uh, narrowly won the uh, popular vote and gained seats in both houses of Congress and yet managed to suffer devastating defeat uh, based on where the votes uh, fell uh, in the Electoral College. So the question of, of whether the xenophobic approaches uh, were effective this cycle strikes me as a much more live question for analysis uh, than previous examples I can think of in earlier cycles. Paula? The level of personal attack in uh, this cycle strikes me as kind of not unusual. We could look at 1828. We could uh, look at 1824 and its aftermath. We can look uh, for you know, uh, most any election in the 19th century. I began to think 
um, about 1884 in in this connection also where the election seemed to have to do with how on one side one candidate had an illegitimate child and on the other side a candidate who had a history of uh, corruption, dealings with railroads, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, all of that strikes me as not particularly unusual and not something where, on the other hand, we seem to get ourselves up into a lather about how uh, this was, uh, you know, an incredibly uh, uh, divisive election and all of that. And at the end, your question about the question about whether this takes us anywhere uh, and what has traction, it's really up to us and uh, and civil society. What I don't see is anything here as divisive, say, as, uh, as slavery. <laughs> yes, it's yeah, good and, to keep those things and, in context. Yeah, and other uh, election cycles where you could see similar kinds of xenoph- obviously xenophobic, xenophobic rather, and racist approaches with the degree to which the Democrats rebuilt themselves as a national party in the 1860s and 1870s on a quite explicitly uh, a white supremacist platform, branding the Republicans as the black Republicans. A lot of the iconography of those elections were quite obviously, quite frankly, even by the standards of the day, quite obviously uh, uh, racist. It's not like you have to read that back as a historian from a contemporary example. Except that even in 1872, the Democrats were noticed that they, they weren't going to carry a national election uh, with that in mind. Uh, and so at that point, we're looking for some sort of new departure. Um, and uh, and the Democrats struggled with that. Yeah. An- another cycle that, that I saw as an analogy, not in terms of what the campaign itself was like, but if we're interested in, uh, you know, Paula mentioned, you know, how we handle this moving forward uh, as a divided a nation and as a divided culture. The other cycle that occurred to me as analogous was 1920, um, where the campaign itself was not particularly vitriolic. Um, But in retrospect, that clearly represents a turning point uh, between an era in American history uh, where uh, a generation of immigration had made the country much more cosmopolitan, particularly in urban areas, and in which uh, the Wilson administration had uh, recently uh, based a great deal of its legitimacy uh, on the internationalist nature of its foreign policy views. Um, that was followed by uh, a period of social violence after World War I, of, uh, of labor strikes in 1919, the people associated with Bolshevism, uh, race riots in places like Chicago, uh, uh, what we today would uh, almost certainly call the terrorist bombings and fear of domestic infiltration. Um, and there was a, a period of social violence that a lot of Americans interpreted as the result of the confluence of the country becoming more cosmopolitan and the country becoming more internationalist. And it was followed by an era of immigration restriction, uh, an era in which uh, the politics of city versus country revolved around things like the emergence of the Ku Klux Klan, the second Ku Klux Klan. Um, And I think speaking as someone from the center-left, Uh, looking back to previous cycles for what I'm afraid might happen, um, uh, the the cultural politics of the 1920s represent something that I think uh, some of the people who were very disappointed this week are afraid we might be be entering into. Well, though we should remember that it was the Democratic, it was Woodrow Wilson uh, who had uh, yes, clamp down on dissent and all of that. And uh, it was, on the other hand, the Democrats, the Democratic Party's job to rebuild its shattered base yes. that never quite figured and, out. And the coalitions were so different at the time um, that, that that was an election where, you know, that was not a fact. I think that might have been the largest uh, popular vote spread of any two two party, straight two party election. And, and so the coalitions were very different. But, but I know a lot of people who are disappointed this week are as disappointed about uh, whether or not we're going to enter a period where the kind of white nationalist politics that's been represented on social media the last six months or so, is that going to taper off or are we going to be dealing with that in the culture over the next 10 years? Well, that's a perfect transition to our next question. 
So as Mark pointed out, there were some gains by Democrats in the House and Senate, even though it wasn't enough. So while the first female nominee from a major party was defeated this year, the Senate now has more female senators than ever before and is generally becoming more ethnically diverse. What did the election expose about what's going on in the country in terms of race and gender? Kimberly? Thank you for that. Um, I think that in terms of the level of vitriol, I do think um, before we talk about where we're going to emphasize that the contrast or distinction between the 2016 election is the, the forthright level of misogyny that was expressed during the campaign. And I think it's important to connect that to other trends in our culture, um, such as, you know, rape culture and the continued problems of sexual harassment and sexual assault on college campuses and elsewhere. And I think in the way that our media um, in some ways tacitly in some places explicitly condones, accepts, promotes such things through the sorts of television shows and movies that we watch. So I think that that is, for me, a huge part of this election. I do think that um, it revealed, exposed, made acceptable some of these darker areas of our culture. You know, I drove to work, you know, in southwest Ohio behind bumper stickers that say Trump that bitch. So I think we need to acknowledge that that was an important part of this election. Um, But on the looking forward side, in some ways, I also feel like maybe this is a Clarence Thomas moment, um, because I've been thinking about, you know, Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, and we saw the confirmation of Clarence Thomas by an all-white, all-male, you know, Judiciary Committee, and then the largely white male congressional approval. But as a result of this sort of public nature of those hearings and the public referendum on sexual assault or sexual harassment and sexual assault. Now we have a culture that recognizes that sexual harassment, you know, is illegal, that it is a thing, that there are lawyers who specialize in this and that women can now bring claims about sexual harassment and win, even in places like Fox News, whereas previously that wasn't part of our national consciousness, the level that it is now. So that's in some ways how I'm thinking about this. Maybe we have the moment where we discuss the sorts of misogynistic things that Trump has said and that Trump's candidacy, um, the election of Trump has made kind of, in some ways you may say, acceptable or shown that people think that that's okay, but that in the aftermath of this, maybe we'll have a larger conversation, which will lead to real change on those issues. Was misogyny okay when it had to do with Sarah Palin? No. Okay. Well, or Elizabeth Dole. I mean, I've written a lot about the history of other women running for president, and they, too, were 100% subject to misogynistic attacks. But because they didn't make it as far as Hillary, neither did these misogynistic attacks. Of course, misogyny was a factor for Sarah Palin. Of course, it was for Geraldine Ferraro. Of course, it was for Margaret Chase Smith and all of the women who ran before. But we didn't talk about it as much because they were not the major party nominee. So it didn't create, of course, any of these tendencies, but by exposing them and even stirring them up, it's led to a conversation and that you see as potentially being productive. Yes, that's what my hopeful side <laughs> thinks. <laughs> Well, let's uh, turn to sort of a question of uh, trust in the system. Um, So despite the lack of evidence supporting Trump's claims of voting rigging or potential voting rigging, the numbers of people who shared his suspicions suggest that there was a profound mistrust of the democratic system as a whole, the media and political elites. So any thoughts on how such a lack of trust played out in the past and what might have contributed to our lack of trust in the system and elites today? Well, it's difficult to know how to approach that because the people who thought they didn't trust the system seem to have won, and so now they're not so worried about trust in the system. I, I will say that, that, again, to compare this cycle uh, to the 2000 cycle, uh, in terms, even in terms of the way it played out election night, obviously this didn't last for a month, but we, we saw a, a similar uh, play out on election night uh, of an election that did not look close at the beginning of the night, uh, and then narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down and then led to a situation where there might have been recounts and the person who had won the popular vote looked like they weren't going to win the electoral vote. And I actually think part of the reason there that things have been calm with respect to the uh, legitimacy of the election under those circumstances is a lot, a lot of people went through it in 2000. And a lot of people 
saw the pro- saw the system survive the process of filtering it out in what was actually a much more prolonged and problematic uh, situation than than this one was. I also have a suspicion that there were so many unusual and unprecedented things about this particular cycle that it can be hard to separate them all out. And things that under ordinary circumstances would have stood out as something to be outraged about just get buried in the total signal. Such as? Um, uh, well, I, I think there are are three or perhaps four different layers uh, of how Donald Trump is an unprecedented candidate that we tend to conflate when we talk about him, some of which we've already mentioned. The, uh, one is that he's completely uh, devoid of any kind of public service experience of any kind. Um, his uh, rhetoric was both uh, xenophobic and also obviously less interested in leaving a trail of breadcrumbs back to the truth than previous candidates. <laughs> And in fact, some of the divisive rhetoric we've been talking about when we've been making analogies to previous cycles, most of them have been uh, been by surrogates. The anti-Catholicism in 1928, I don't recall coming out of Herbert Hoover's mouth. It was traced to surrogates. Well, well candidates still were shy about yeah. uh, campaigning in person yes. at all. So, Not the case um, this election. Not the, no. case, not the case this election. And then there's also the layer of, of Trump getting the nomination despite – being largely at war with his party on a variety of policy and structural... And continue to and be. And continuing to be. Uh, I, um, I mean, in the middle of the campaign, picking yeah. fights with Paul Ryan. The closest analogy I could think of here is 1848, which was different because it was the Whig party that mm-hmm. picked Zach Taylor, uh, not, the, not the base that probably would have preferred Henry Clay, uh, but uh, someone who had never voted... Uh, wasn't clear he was a Whig or anything else, was writing too much, which was you know, that version of talking too much, <laughs> uh, to the point where the you know, party leadership was really trying to shut him down and stick a pillow over him. They cut off his Twitter access. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they, they did their version of cutting, of yeah. just pulling, yes, of, of doing that. Uh, and who then was allowed to say something like, I'm a Whig, not an ultra Whig, um, and, and wound up being someone in office in the two years that he served before he died, being someone who confounded both parties. Kimberly, do you have anything to add? Um, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about that also I think maybe distinguishes this election, or that this election is the culmination of some 20th century trends. One I think a lot about is what some sociologists, there's a great book called The Big Sort, you know, sort of how we sort ourselves into like-minded groups and how this longer tradition of civil discussion, civil debate being kind of eroded um, in the last 30, 40 years. And I'm also thinking here of Jill Lepore's great recent article in The New Yorker about the presidential debates, but also about how regular people debate and sort of the demise of high school debate teams and the fact that now we have, you know, again, since the 70s and 80s, really sorted ourselves into kind of like-minded bubbles that play out in electoral maps in terms of redistricting and that play out by supporting extremism because when we mostly talk to people who believe what we believe it's more you know it's easier to go extreme whereas when we talk to people who with whom we disagree the conversation tends to moderate itself as you learn other ideas and now i think one other thing that i'm thinking about and i think that this election is not just not necessarily distinguished by because this is a longer trend but that i think it's maybe the kind of apotheosis of is this this big sort of ourselves into um, extreme camps. And I feel like, I don't know, as a nation, how many more 49.8 to 49.9 elections we're going to have before we start thinking, how can we maybe reverse this trend? How can we talk to each other? And how do we engage with people with whom we disagree in the absence of, you know, bowling leagues and (laughs) sort of community (laughs) ties that used to bring people of different ideas um, in, in, into contact with each other. You can you can trace Kimberly's point on the map, uh, on the electoral map, particularly if you think about this as the replay of similar developments over the last few cycles. And a significant uh, examples of, of the big sort that you can see on the map is that, if anything, the city mouse, country mouse thing has been intensifying and becoming mm-hmm. and becoming more uniform nationally. Uh, become uh, yeah. and regional differences north south going away a little bit. So to take some specific examples, in Ohio, um, in the 2000 cycle, 
Uh, there were uh, pockets uh, of strong Democratic support in parts of the state that were industrial but not urban and cosmopolitan, in particular uh, along the Ohio River, uh, parts of the industrial Northeast. Um, and, and those are now solidly red and in particular have moved uh, particularly to the right uh, since the Obama cycles. Cincinnati, on the other hand, was once a city that voted Republican, um, and Cincinnati uh, uh, now looks very much like any other city. The other map I, I looked at closely was the Texas map. And, mm-hmm. and, Hill, and the Clint, Clinton did uh, as well on a percentage basis in Texas as she did in, as she did in Ohio. And the map looks the same. She won Harris County substantially. She won Dallas substantially. She won Austin substantially. Uh, and, and, she lost, and she lost the West Texas Flats by a, an equally large margin. And if you look at the electoral map in 2000, as a historian, your brain immediately goes, oh, look, there's north-south. But if you look at it county by county, you see evidence of what Kimberly is talking about, that, that the people who are very disappointed this week overwhelmingly live near other people who were disappointed this week and vice versa. One thing to be interested in what you think is we've seen a cycle since uh, the 1980s of, uh, of uh, what got summarized as the culture wars. And the culture wars, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, the Republicans lost. Uh, and lost uh, uh, through the 1990s, it was clear, and a loss that, ex- that accelerated. And we could see this also in um, what I think could only be described as the demoralization of evangelicals who are still part of the Republican coalition. But the kind of, you know, we have the, the kind of energy, we have uh, a plan, we're mobilized, we're organized, seems to have dissipated, voted for uh, Trump despite the, that. Lots about Donald Trump's right. <laughs> history uh, <laughs> I, I, is, was sort of anathema. So uh, have we reached the – are we looking at the end perhaps of uh, the energy drawn by the culture wars? Well, I have two quick observations about that, the first being that uh, uh, principled religious conservatives are in some ways as – not just as disappointed but as shocked to learn the world is not what they thought it was – uh, as uh, some people are on the left are this week. My other observation about the culture wars is that I can think of a, a number of previous uh, the cultural turning points in which, it, in which it's clear in the long run that the liberals won the culture war in the culture, which was followed by an election where they lost at the polls. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, uh, that's a, a common interpretation of the second half of the 1960s uh, where Jefferson Airplane wins in the culture and Richard Nixon winds up in the White House. And and we that we may have a cycle like that where a number of significant victories uh, uh, in terms of gay marriage, in terms of putting uh, transgender rights uh, into the conversation in a way that it really wasn't maybe even four years ago, never mind eight years ago. But part of what was striking about this cycle is uh, how class seems to have mattered. We also see it you know, on the fringes in the culture, too. Uh, at least in terms of uh, you know, new books that have gotten lots of attention, White Trash, for example, mm-hmm. um, and uh, wondering if that's a different dynamic that's beginning to break. So where do the parties go from here then? Are going to keep them as is, or are we seeing a realignment? I had an answer ready for this when I thought Clinton was going to win a narrow victory. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, and I, th- I thought the real, uh, I thought the asteroid would miss us this cycle, but that the asteroid would hit us I- in the midterm cycle, uh, because of the seats that the Democrats have. To, you know, the conversation we're about to try to have now, I thought we were going to have in two years, and this is actually why I think the boring issue of staffing of the administration may actually be quite interesting to pay attention to, in terms of whether or not the White House and congressional leadership actually wind up at war with one another in the way that the rhetoric of the campaign suggested they might. You know, that's kind of a question mark as well. Well, and also in all of this, we need to remember that events matter and uh, that events that haven't happened yet. Otherwise, the, I get the sense that there's some there'll be some tension in the Democratic Party uh, in two ways. Uh, one is the the kind of Sanders or Warren-Clinton uh, divide that will have to get itself worked out. 
And the other is just the sort of nuts and bolts stuff in rebuilding state parties. I mean, Obama had once talked about and put into practice in 2008 uh, the 50 state strategy, which mm-hmm. seems to have disappeared entirely. And so it's the wipeout in the states. Yeah, and that's a and consequence the, of the big sort, too, if you look at the map county by county. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and but that leaves a very shallow bench. Yes. Another issue I think we should be mindful of, and especially as historians and humanities scholars, I want to urge us to keep thinking about and talking about that I think has been revealed by this election is our increasing trust on data and big data, and in this case, polling. I think um, the 2016 election is also a story of misplaced trust (laughs) in so-called big data and polls, and this is something that's continually and increasingly shaping our world. And I think we need to keep saying, is this is this right? You know, data is not necessarily evidence. It's information, but it's not necessarily conclusive. Not all not all data is created equal. And I think that part of the shock of the 2016 election is that nobody really saw it coming except for maybe a few lone voices in political science, a few a few people in the Trump campaign, maybe. But for the most part, the people who trusted, you know, the polls. And look to hope, you know, with hope to sort of the New York Times ticker every day. What are the odds? What are the odds? <laughs> we were the ones who were most shocked. So I think also this is a, a call to question our increasing reliance on big data and to also question sort of the ideology of big data and what kind of information exactly is contained, whose voices and, are in and, and, and just to, are out. Yeah, and to uh, add to that, uh, the other unusual thing about the Trump campaign is how little it spent, how few consultants it had on. <laughs> they, and, it, uh, it, and, I don't and, think it's too much of an exaggeration to say they won the presidency without running a presidential campaign. In, not, in, not in, in the, terms of what not people used to think yeah, not that the, meant. Not in the, uh, in the sense that it's become where you needed and, your big data operation. Yeah. And, and imagine those consultants right. uh, who have uh, become not only stars in their own right, but, uh, but, right. but extraordinarily yeah. well paid. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, so as we're kind of wrapping up here then, uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, I was impressed by how, at least at some level, the – Institutions and normal stuff seemed to work. Uh, the speeches that we heard from Trump and Clinton and Obama were all what, exactly, they, sh- what they should have been. Yeah. Exactly yeah. what they should have been. And coming out of the craziness of this campaign, I found that striking and uh, a good sign. And it's uh, maybe we can, in a very strange way, expect some normal. In terms of thinking about normal, one thing I will be trying to pay attention to is because I expect to be outraged by the coming administration based on my personal political views. And so I will be trying to separate out whether I'm outraged by something that would have happened in a Cruz administration or is it something that is happening that is uniquely problematic because it's not Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio but because it's something unique to to who wound up on the top of the ticket, because those things can be very easy to to conflate. I'm heartened by a couple of things. One is the local elections, I think, tell a somewhat different story than the Trump victory, at least in southern Ohio, where I live. So I kind of am heartened by the local and, and energized by working more locally. Um and the second is I've been really heartened by the emergence of this wonderful secret Facebook group, Pantsuit Nation. <laughs> I don't know um, to what extent other people are a member of this, but Hillary referenced it and thanked it, you know, in, in her wonderful and gracious and brilliant speech. Um, and this has really emerged. And I hope that this can emerge as sort of a, you know, I hate to say this, but sort of a tea party for the left in some ways. It's a, it's a nonpartisan. I mean, it's it's women and men from various political parties from all sorts of backgrounds from all around the country united around this, you know, stronger together model. So it was united by support of Hillary, but also in these larger ideals of what kind of nation do we want to live in and how can we be stronger together? So one of the most um, heartening posts I saw uh, on Wednesday was a woman who posted on Pantsuit Nation, what if we made this a pack? What if we made this a super pack? And what, how could we take this energy forward? So I, I hope that that happens, and I would really like to be a part of it and to one day live in Pantsuit Nation. <laughs>
Well, we'll wrap it up on that note. Thank you to our three historians, Kimberly Hamlin, Associate Professor of History and American Studies at Miami University, Mark Hoger, a Senior Lecturer at OSU, and Paula Baker, an Associate Professor also at OSU. Thank you. Thank you so much. This episode of the History Talk podcast was brought to you by Origins, Current Events, and Historic Perspective, an online publication of the Public History Initiative at the Goldberg Center, and the History Department at The Ohio State University in Columbus, and Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Our main editors are Steve Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley, and our audio and technical advisor is Paul Kohlheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Brenna Miller and Jessica Blissett. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcast and more on our website at origins.osu, on iTunes, and on SoundCloud. And as always, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for listening.